In 1883, a drink called Kronk started advertising in the Calgary Herald. See if you can spot their ads. Kronk. Kronk is good. Buy Kronk. Kronk is the drink. Drink Kronk. Dr. Kronk. Did you spot them? Good. Even though they're nearly 140 years old, they remind me of the ads for OK Soda, their first ads just reading OK, or No Name, a Canadian supermarket brand whose ads are, let's say, aggressively plain. But there's nothing plain about Crunk. When you see that word, Crunk, you immediately need to know more. Like, what is Crunk, and who was Crunk, and who wrote those amazing ads? And can I have some Crunk? Just looking at the ads from the Calgary Herald, it's not exactly clear what Kronk is. Kronk definitely seems like a drink, actually the drink, which is a start, but for the purposes of an unnecessarily long video, not really enough. So let's go briefly forwards and then backwards in time to figure this out. Here's an ad from the Larned Chronoscope, the best-named Republican-aligned newspaper in mid-19th century Kansas, from 1884, that advertises Kronk under its fuller name, Dr. Kronk's Sarsaparilla Beer, calling it healthful and invigorating. Hopping back to 1850, an ad from the Daily National Union describes Kronk as a beverage that blends the rare qualities of luxury and health used by the sober, intelligent, and scientific part of all the northern and eastern cities. Going back further still to 1846, the Syracuse Star says, I am prepared to say that no medicine compounded within my knowledge, not to say beer, contains more valuable ingredients. Their nature is such as to come truly within the term remedies. Their combination is healthful as well as scientific. It contains valuable tonic, sedative, alternative, antiseptic, antiscorbutic, and diuretic properties, all of which are required to keep the circulation healthful and vigorous. Two things. First, antiscorbutic means fight scurvy, a disease caused by a lack of vitamin C, less well known as ascorbic acid. Second, what is actually in Crunk? Happily for all of us, there is a recipe in the Handbook of Practical Receipts or Useful Hints in Everyday Life, published in 1860 and credited to an American gentleman and lady. The handbook itself is a pretty wild ride. Chapter 1 offers a variety of moral hints. Chapter 2 gets into simple and safe remedies for common diseases and accidents, including a dreaded and loathsome disease simply referred to as the itch. Chapter 3 lets you know how to obtain good health and bodily vigor. Mostly it just tells you to diet, exercise, bathe, and breathe, all good tips, but also advises that too much mental excitement produces a cold skin. So let's keep that in mind going forward. And finally, we arrive at Chapter 4, Miscellaneous Recipes. There is so much going on in this chapter. There's a recipe for making coffee that involves adding part of an egg or a bit of a fish skin. There are instructions for bathing that warn deaths are often recorded from premature bathing. And later on, there's a recipe for toast water, which involves putting some toast in boiling water and then drinking it on purpose. We can find the main event here on page 34, Dr. Kronk's Sarsaparilla Beer. Let's look at what's inside. Sassafras was a main ingredient in root beer until it was banned by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in 1960 when lab rats developed liver damage and cancer after being given large doses of safrole, a chemical in sassafras. Safrole, perhaps better known as 5-prop-2-anyl-1-3-benzo-dioxyl, can be used to manufacture MDMA, though to be fair, it is also a component of nutmeg, cinnamon, anise, and black pepper. It also apparently smells like a candy shop. Four pounds of sarsaparilla. Sarsaparilla, which apparently does have each of those letters in its name, is also a common ingredient in root beer. By itself, it's also commonly found in so-called temperance drinks at the time and, and, and other 19th century sodas. Two pounds hops. Hops are the little flowers that make beer taste like little flowers. This is super non-specific though, there are lots of varieties of hops. One pound of chamomile blows. Chamomile blows are the, the flowers of chamomile plants. One pound of cinnamon, five pounds of ginger, a pint of extract of sarsaparilla, 
boil them all together two hours, have ready steeped half a pound of green tea, which add, then strain into a vat or tub, and add ten gallons of molasses and a hundred gallons of water. Stir in thoroughly one quart of yeast, and scent to suit to your taste. Let stand until fermented, then bottle for use. So, it'll probably taste like root beer, maybe a little spicy, maybe a little bit like green tea kombucha, probably a little bit alcoholic. No idea. But at least we know it's a drink, and a drink from a doctor no less, so you know it's going to be good for you. Pharmacists putting the word doctor in drinks they made was pretty common in the 19th century. Dr. Pepper, for example, was made by Charles Alderton, a pharmacist. Pepsi was made by Caleb Bradham, another pharmacist, and a marketing genius who initially named it Brad's Drink. And Coca-Cola was made by John Stith Pemberton, a Confederate soldier turned pharmacist, who was looking for a recipe to help him get over his morphine addiction that he developed trying to deal with the pain of his Civil War saber wound. His first drink, called Dr. T.S. Tuggle's Compound Syrup of Globe Flour, boasted it was made of purely vegetable ingredients, free from opium. Always reassuring. A flop, he later combined a recipe for a cocaine-infused wine with a caffeine-laden cola berry to make Coca-Cola. So, what is crunk? It's probably a spicy, mildly alcoholic root beer. Also, it is the drink. Crunk is the drink. Now that we haven't solved at all the question of what Kronk tastes like, let's equally struggle with the question of who Kronk was. Let's call the first one Warren Kronk A, who lived largely in Albany, New York, and by 1839 was brewing Kronk under the name Dr. Kronk's Compound Sarsaparilla Beer. The other Warren Kronk, let's call him Warren Kronk II, was also a soda water manufacturer, and he lived on both sides of the border in the Windsor, Detroit area. I think he was the son of Warren Kronk A, though we'll have to wait for the Kronk episode of Who Do You Think You Are? By 1848, Dr. Kronk A had set up a nationwide franchise model for brewing Kronk. Dr. Kronk A would go from town to town around the US and later Canada and license the right to brew the recipe, often to other Kronks, but usually not. There was at least one more Kronk brewing Kronk, the gloriously named Munson Kronk. So when you read stories about Dr. Kronk did this or that, it was probably one of these three Kronks. They're a little hard to trace, but looking at old census records, it seems like the Kronks were either of Dutch or German origin, with Kronk potentially being a short form of the name Kronkite. This franchise model quickly spread Kronk around the US and Canada, but it led to conflicts in several cities involving people concocting counterfeit Kronk, and Warren Kronk A, probably not Warren Kronk II, who would have been a child at the time, took out ads excoriating the Crank Kronk dealers. February 1848. Warren Kronk A warned the people of Norwalk, Ohio, in the Huron Reflector, that a man by the name of Horace Connor, together with some other persons of Fairfield, Huron County, have held forth to the public that they were in possession of the knowledge of the composition and the modus operandi of preparing for use that healthful and pleasant beverage known as Dr. Kronk's Compound Sarsaparilla Beer and thereby have deceived some, and obtained from them money for the same. I have thought it to be but an act of justice, which the public had a right to claim at my hands, and a duty I owe to myself to say that every person who has knowledge of a genuine article, and who is authorized by me to act as agents, has the papers to show that fact. And let me say here, that I have never authorized any such man as Connor, or any set of men to act for me in the state. By the early 1850s, Kronk had spread across the U.S., and like all beverages of the time, Kronk was peripherally involved in an Ohio circus riot, the Hippodrome War of 1853. Welch's Parisian Hippodrome was a traveling circus, not from Paris, and one night while in Somerset, Ohio, some railroad workers and some circus showmen got into a fight sparked by indoor smoking. The showmen drove their antagonists outside of the tent. Iron pins, clubs, stones, and beer bottles were the principal weapons used. Near the entrance to the tent stood a wagon, loaded with crunk beer, in stone bottles, which were unceremoniously captured by the showman, and effectively used during the remainder of the fight, and it is not improbable that the beer vendor's ammunition, pressed into service, decided the result. The showmen were victorious, and soon their opponents withdrew from the episode. When quiet once more reigned, the performance was renewed, and the program fully presented to an audience still large, though very considerably lessened. A great many persons were bruised, cut, and otherwise injured in the fight, 
but only one fatally. These nearly 100% non-lethal weapons, the Kronk bottles themselves, are the main physical legacy of Kronk left in the world, and much of our knowledge of Kronk comes from modern-day societies of bottle collectors. And the Hippodrome War of 1853 wasn't the only source of Kronk-related legal trouble. Kronk found its way into case law in Ontario in 1887. In the case of R.V. Beard, John Beard was contesting his conviction for unlawfully selling liquor, contrary to the Canada Temperance Act of 1878, for which he was fined $50. Walter Tudope testified. I might have been at Mr. Beard's four weeks ago last Saturday. I had something to drink there. I had Kronk. I did not get it at Mr. Beard's house. I got it in the woodshed. I did not have anything else to drink besides crunk. The crunk was a kind of yellowish color. On cross-examination, I could not pledge my oath that crunk is or is not intoxicating. The judge ruled, the affirmative testimony here is that a kind of beer called crunk and another beverage made of lime juice, sugar, ginger, and water were partaken of by the parties on the occasion in question. Not a syllable is there that either of these was spirituous or intoxicating. On the contrary, it appears that crunk is beer and lime juice is the color of whiskey. The magistrates assume that one or both were intoxicating or spirituous, and on this want of testimony, this defendant has been convicted. I therefore order that this conviction be quashed. There's also a fun story from Hazleton, Pennsylvania, about the local crunk dealer, Neil Paul, titled Had Too Much Crunk. A horse belonging to Neil Paul, the crunk dealer, balked yesterday in front of H.W. Meyer's bookstore. The horse backed the wagon into the pavement. Every time Neil would hit the horse, it would kick as high as the dashboard. Having no way to start the horse, Neil got on its back, Ben Nicholson and Neil McBridge each got a hold of the horse's head, and started it off. The affair was great amusement for a large number of people. Some of the expressions heard were, Give it a drink of crunk, Neil. Did you feed it this morning, Neil? Get off and carry the horse, Neil. Push on the lines, Neil, etc. It's nice to know that heckling hasn't changed much in 150 years. So who was Dr. Kronk? He was Warren Kronk A, and also Warren Kronk II, and also Munson Kronk, and a whole network of Kronk-endorsed franchisees across North America who sold Kronk from the late 1830s to the 1910s. Around 1910, newspaper records of Kronk beer start to dry up, though I have found mentions of people selling it as late as 1919. By the 1920s, people were reminiscing about the good old days of Kronk beer, and there's an article in 1930 wondering why this old-timey drink was even named Kronk to begin with, having forgotten the legacy of Warren Kronk A, and also two. Here's the thing, though. None of this really matters. I, I don't mean in the cosmic sense, obviously this is all incredibly important. But my favorite part about Krunk isn't how it combines sarsaparilla and chamomile, or even the nationwide distribution network set up by Warren Krunk A. My real, and honestly depending on how it tastes, potentially only, favorite part of Krunk was the ads. Other ads for Krunk at the time were maybe more descriptive and honestly more helpful, but I wouldn't be making this video if I had found those instead. The ads I showed you at the beginning are absolutely incredible. I mean, it wasn't the genius of Dr. Kronk himself that made them great. It was whoever wrote them. So do we know who wrote them? It's actually a pretty hard one to answer definitively. The ads are pretty similar in style to others from around the same time in the Cowrie Herald. Here's one from a few months after the Kronk ads for a hat store named King's that just reads, if you want a good hat, go to King's. However, we probably can find out who placed the ads. Another ad for Crunk in the Calgary Herald revealed that the drink was available at the Star Bakery. Another one from the next year also claimed Claxton makes Crunk. F.J. Claxton, Frank apparently, was the owner and operator of Star Bakery. He also opened Calgary's first ice skating and curling rink, and got into a complicated rivalry with a nearby roller skating rink that I won't tell you about here. It seems like by 1885, Claxton listed the bakery for sale, with business calling him East. But he does seem to have stuck around Calgary. He was selling oysters in 1888, two English retriever pups a few years later, and in 1894 he ran for city council. During the campaign it does appear that he missed the debate, but he did send along a letter saying that he would be economical. He didn't win, placing fifth out of seven. The top three candidates were elected. 
census records suggest that he might have moved to Denver by 1900 and was potentially living in California in 1930 at age 90, but it's hard to say and honestly it would take a few weeks to really figure out the genealogy of this branch of Claxton's. But why isn't it hard to say is that this man, Frank J. Claxton, owner of Star Bakery in Calgary, is the real hero of Kronk. A man who was as economical with his words as he was with his statement during his unsuccessful city council run. Final question. Can I have some crunk? Quite accidentally, the answer is yes. I found these ads at the end of June 2020, and I tweeted them out, and within hours, my Twitter followers at first and then random strangers later on, started submitting their research. Jennifer Davis found the recipe, Jason Marcus off the letter from the Historical Bottle Collection Society. CBC Calvary got in touch to check Kronk less than 24 hours after the tweet, and again the next day after we found the recipe. By the day after that, a brewery in Calgary, Cold Garden, started brewing Kronk, which should be available late July 2020. There are t-shirts. There is a popular YouTube channel, Glenn and Friends Cooking, that's spinning up a batch in a video that's probably already been released, and is apparently 2.9% alcohol by volume. It got lots of other coverage on TV, radio, print, and somehow made it to The Guardian. Why? First, the internet is capricious. Second, the ads are amazing. And third, there is a global pandemic happening right now, and there is not very much else to do. But mostly, Mostly, because Kronk is the drink.